The Mr. Beacon Podcast is sponsored by Williot. Scaling IoT with battery-free Bluetooth. So welcome back to the Mr. Beacon podcast. We are super excited uh, because this week we're interviewing Ken Calderup, who's the Vice President of Marketing for the Bluetooth SIG. Ken, welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me. Glad to be here. Well, uh, we, we are, you're not the first person from the Bluetooth SIG. A lot of people don't even know that the SIG exists. They just, I, I guess, think that Bluetooth miraculously appeared, but we've had Mark Powell, who uh, uh, the your illustrious leader, uh, talking about Bluetooth in the past. So anyone who wants to find out more about the, the SIG can go to that episode. And we've had uh, uh, Simon uh, Slupik, who, uh, who chairs the Mesh Working Group, and some great sessions with that. This time, I'm really pleased that you've joined us because um, the SIG has got through another milestone with 5.1. Uh, the latest version of the Bluetooth standard. So um, I'm looking forward to hearing from you about what's in that so that our uh, viewers and listeners can uh, be smart about that and uh, help help inform their conversations and their, their plans based on what's happening in this really key standard. But for, for those that haven't been as close as others, maybe you can just remind us a bit about uh, what the Bluetooth SIG is, because it's not, Bluetooth isn't just a technology, it's a, it's a community and an organization, isn't it? That's right. So, um, uh, as you may recall, last, last year we celebrated the 20th anniversary, in fact, of the Bluetooth SIG. Um, so, yeah, it is a, Bluetooth SIG Inc., is with, who uh, I'm with, is uh, the company that is charged with kind of overseeing Bluetooth technology. And, um, uh, you know, we, you know, we, at the end of the day, we have three basic jobs that we're, we're looking to do, uh, specification for, uh, qualification and, and promotion. Uh, so first is to, uh, help evolve Bluetooth technology itself and continue to add capabilities to Bluetooth. And we do that actually by facilitating the collaboration of our member companies to create new specs or to enhance the existing specifications. And that's the you know, 34,000 member companies we have around the world now. Obviously, a, a subset of that are really deep, you know, involved in day-to-day -day spec development. But that's probably one of our biggest charters is to, to go help drive the technology forward. Uh, the second is qualification. And, and there, we're looking to help drive global product uh, interoperability. You know, Bluetooth brand stands for a lot of interoperability that that brand means that this product's going to work with that product. Um, we have various programs to do that. One of the biggest ones is we, we operate and maintain a product qualification program uh, that people take their products through before they bring them to market. And again, to help sure, ensure you know, global interoperability. Um, the last is promotion, and that's, that's my, my responsibility. And at the end of the day, that's about increasing the overall, you know, awareness, um, understanding, and understanding, and um, you know, most most of all, the the ultimately the adoption, you know, of, of Bluetooth as a technology. Um, so that's my area. Um, we do classic communication stuff. So there's a team that looks after events and and web and blog and social and all kinds of programs to help uh, push the Bluetooth story and message out there and forward. Uh, we have a, a market development team, which does a lot of very focused, uh, more kind of business development efforts uh, focused around uh, really new Bluetooth technology and Bluetooth markets that we're trying to help uh, grow and promote. Um, and then we have a developer relations team that does a lot of direct touch with uh, developers around the world. They do a lot of you know, classic evangelism things. They speak at probably 100 events a year, do a lot of blog posting, technical content, things like that. So that's... That's what we do. Oh, it's an amazing brand. And I want to come back to this and talk a bit about that because as a marketing person, I'm uh, fascinated by how you're kind of managing this, uh, this brand that has incredible equity. It's recognized all around the world. But I want to uh, get into the meat of 5.1 and direction finding and, and really brief people on that first. So, so yeah, 5.1 came out uh, th like three months ago, I, I guess. Um, yeah, January. How's it, uh, how's it been received? And, and, and more importantly, what's in it? <laughs> uh, let's we'll start with the what's in it, and then we'll talk about yeah. how these technology, how when we release new capabilities, how it generally comes into the market over, yeah. over a period of time. 
So um, uh, 5.1 is actually the latest version of the Bluetooth core specification. So version 5.1. Uh, Bluetooth actually has over 100 different specifications, but people are probably most familiar with the core spec, and uh, which defines the, the, the radio and a lot of the connectivity uh, layer involved, uh, involved with, with Bluetooth technology. So version 5.1, um, and, and usually we're on a cycle of every 18 months to 36 months releasing a new version of the core spec where we bring in new features and functions to Bluetooth. So version 5.1 came out in January of this year, 2019, and the kind of the anchor new feature for that was something called radio direction finding, uh, which you're you know very familiar with from some of the, the markets that you, you happen to participate in your, mm -hmm. yourself. Um, there were some other, and we can talk a little bit more about that, but there were some other capabilities, but they're really more, you know, minor, uh, more minor enhancements to existing features. And it gets pretty low level esoteric stuff like enhancements to GAT caching, um, you know, for instance, um, randomization of, of channel indexing during advertisements, stuff like that, which we can get into if, you, if you'd like. But really the big key feature here is, is direction finding. Um, uh, you want would, you want to go into that now? Or? I do. Yeah. I mean, it's it's just remarkable how far Bluetooth has come from basically replacing the the cord between the keyboard and the device, and then you know Bluetooth Low Energy came out and the the mesh uh, functionality right. came out, and now this is really I think pushing you into uh, significantly new territory. I mean, it's all leveraging this ubiquity of Bluetooth and the low cost and the massive volume. But um, uh, tell us what, uh, you know, what does direction finding mean? What are the, what are the, 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 the big building blocks within that? Yeah, and you, you bring up something that's a good discussion to have to lead right into that as, you know, Bluetooth has evolved, you know, and most of the time when you mention Bluetooth to someone right now, they kind of point to there and say, oh, that's that yeah. audio stuff. And, and that was our, our starting and it is still today you know, kind of our biggest device category with almost a billion you know, units a year in, in Bluetooth audio. Uh, but as you mentioned, we got into Bluetooth low energy back in 2010, which really got into this low power data transfer, which whole started the whole connected device world. Um, but the interesting thing, which now leads into direction finding is when we launched Bluetooth low energy, there was another capability within low energy that helped stimulate a whole nother market and use case area for Bluetooth or solution area. And that's in this whole location services. Mm -hmm. The fact that Bluetooth supported this kind of basic advertising broadcasting capability, um, a lot of our member companies got really creative with how you could use that as a way to now support a number of, of different kinds of location services. Um, you know, pretty basic proximity ones where you can just use the Bluetooth radio to understand, you know, the signal strength from the Bluetooth radio. So one device could understand how another, you know, approximately how close another device was. And that's what led to the whole, you know, beacon revolution, Mr. Beacon. Yeah. So uh, whether it's beacons for point of interest information services or it's, uh, you know, tile trackers and, and that kind of product that's used for uh, personal item finding so you can find your lost keys. People got really creative how you can use Bluetooth, not just for connecting devices for audio or data transfer, but for, for positioning mm -hmm. and understanding where something is. And that's gone a long, long way for, for the last four or five years. This whole location services market um, has grown quite, quite rapidly, whether it is these kind of more uh, basic proximity systems where it's trying to understand if uh, like a, a personal item finding or point of interest information beacons. But there's also more sophisticated systems around true positioning systems, right? Real-time locating systems, which are used for asset tracking uh, in warehouses or hospitals or office buildings, um, or it's used for um, uh, more indoor positioning systems where it's you know, wayfinding solutions mm -hmm. to trying to do kind of an indoor GPS for finding and helping people navigate their way through, through shopping malls and yeah. office buildings and stadiums and so forth. So Bluetooth, just using that basic kind of, of, of proximity capability has gotten Bluetooth very, very far in this, these location services. Um, but I think a number of years back, people realized that if you could also not only just use Bluetooth to understand how close things were, but added a capability called radio direction finding, you can now not only know nearby, but in which direction another Bluetooth device was. Um, and so, I think that's uh, just to, to interrupt briefly. Yeah. I think uh, 
so you're, you're going to talk about why what we've got now is so much better than what we had. And, and, and I look at what's happened with Bluetooth beacons, and there's millions and millions of beacons that have been sold. But, and sometimes people are just delighted. But other times, I think people have been frustrated. They, they kind of have this expectation that, that, that this is going to give them pinpoint navigation, and they'll be able to find the X and Y of this lost thing. And, and it hasn't always done that. So I, I really... I think that having a better solution to this is really going to make a big difference because then people will be able to choose, oh, do I want proximity? Uh, you know, am I just verifying, yes, I'm in the Apple store? Well, you know, basically signal strength and uh, seeing a beacon is probably good enough for that. But I think those, there's been a fundamental gap between people's expectations and what we've been able to deliver in a really robust way in terms of direction finding and RTLS, as in where are those 1,000 pallets in a warehouse down to the meter? You know, people don't want to, I mean, sometimes people do want to just know, is the pallet there? But fundamentally, there's a lot of times when, hey, I've got 5,000 pallets and I need to tell this one from that one. And, it, and we've really struggled to do that. So, so how does 5.1 solve those problems? That's right, exactly. So you know, as, you, as you mentioned, um, Bluetooth for location services has come a long way, but the big, you know, and, and many things couldn't uh, be done today without Bluetooth, but people want more. And that really comes down to certain things like the level of accuracy you can provide in an asset tracking system, or wouldn't it be nice if that that little t asset tag I put on my keys can not only tell me that it's in the you know it's in the house or it's nearby, but actually in which direction it actually was. So there is absolutely room for improvement um, in, for Bluetooth location services based on today's capability, and that's what direction finding allows you to do. So you know at its simplest, it's it's a very simple concept. All it is, and it's a you know radio finding as a as an, um, as an approach or something like that has been around for a long, long, long time, right? Since the early last century. I mean, it was yeah. like many things, it was used in uh, military applications first where, you know, uh, one guy's trying to understand where a radio signal coming from the enemy might be. So they yeah. built systems in order to try and understand and approximate the direction from which the radio signal was coming. It's the same basic concept that we've added now to Bluetooth, which is trying to have one Bluetooth device understand the direction from which the signal of another Bluetooth device is being transmitted. And we can get into how that's done with the antenna arrays and mm -hmm. angle of arrival and angle of departure, but that's the basic concept. So now not only uh, with Bluetooth, you can understand that a device was kind of nearby, but now you can understand exactly in which direction. Yeah. And that concept now allows those things, those services we talked about to get that next level of performance. So now that that uh, that item finding tag, a personal property tag, can, you know, a system can be developed so my smartphone can tell me not only that it's nearby, but also in what direction and improve that experience. Or as you mentioned, there's an asset tracking system that is currently capable of when using Bluetooth to be able to track pallets or forklifts or whatever on a real-time basis with, you know, in a level of accuracy measured in meters, you know, one meter to 10 meters, depending on the number of locators that you might deploy and the, the makeup of, of, of the facility. Now, all of a sudden, by adding not direction finding, where these locators can not only know when an asset is kind of how far away from each of the locators, but also in what direction, you can get to a much more, a much greater level of accuracy uh, of det when determining and calculating the actual position. So now instead of measuring in meters, you can measure the position you know, within centimeters. I mean, mm -hmm. not maybe one centimeter, but you can now measure it in centimeters. Yeah, that's, yeah, I've seen that. As it, we, we, I think we've seen the demos, the, uh, the Cooper foosball table where they have the locator above the table and they're tracking the, the guys on this, this table and the little, little ball. And that's all kind of based on angles. I, I mean, the thing that I think people, we've been able to kind of fake it with uh, location by simply, this is hot, this is cold. This, this, this beacon is super close to this uh, receiver and it's far away from this receiver and it's kind of fairly close to this one. Therefore... This, this beacon is here, but now it seems like what we're going to be able to do is say, oh, this signal is coming in from between 13 and 14 degrees direction from this reference point. And, and that is just such a better basis for doing this. So what, what is, um, so there's two aspects that I think really 
you've done a very good job of setting out the, the, the table um, of, of what's in here. If we double click and we look at angle of arrival and angle of departure, can you give us a, a sense of what the difference is between those two things? That's right. So there's two um, kind of approaches to doing radio direction finding. One is called angle of arrival and the other is called angle of departure. And really, it has to do with with which device is, is calculating the you know the the signal direction. And am I trying to determine angle of arrival? Is for instance, what's but maybe we should back up and say with the, have a in picture a kind of a specific use case for each one. Yeah. Angle of arrival is really are for those systems like asset tracking, where you have these um, uh, locators that are in fixed positions throughout a facility that are listening for. Bluetooth beacons or asset tags. And so then you have these transmitters that are constantly, that are attached to little to pallets, to equipment as it goes throughout, and they're constantly transmitting out a signal. Mm -hmm. um, now these locators that are listening for those beacons can now not only kind of uh, report back to a location engine that's calculating positions, um, hey, how far away the, these asset tags may, that it's tracking may happen to be, but now also in which direction. And so angle of arrival means that there, to, to determine the, the, the direction of the signal, um, the, the tag is, is propagating out a signal and it's hitting um, an antenna array, which is now in the locator. And it's calculating that angle of the arrival of the signal across that antenna array is what is, is referred to about angle of arrival and determining the, the signal direction. Okay. So that's at a very high level, the concept of angle, angle of arrival. Now, angle of departure, you flip that whole thing on its head, and it's a little bit conceptually harder to realize, but it is, but if you think about it in the way GPS systems work, that's mm -hmm. probably the most closest analogy. Now, instead of these, these um, locators being the ones that are receiving the signals from the tags, it's the roles are reversed. Mm -hmm. Now there are actually transmitters that are in fixed locations throughout a building. Mm -hmm. And maybe in GPS, you can think about those as the satellites that are, that are up in the sky. Yeah. And now there's something like, uh, think about wayfinding in a, uh, in a mall where you have an app on your phone that's trying to help you navigate through that facility. So now the, the app on the phone is listening for the, the, these various signals coming from these various transmitters. And now these transmitters actually also have a, an antenna array. We can get into that whole discussion as well. But they're all transmitting. And so now the, the, it's the, uh, the angle of the arrival from those signals into the phone, which is now being calculated. So okay. the phone is able to, to see these signals coming from the various uh, locator beacons or yeah. like GPS satellites. And it's a, based on what it's seen for each of those signals, it now has intelligence that allows it to try and uh, to be able to determine the, the, the direction from which that, that transmitter is, is uh, coming from. Okay. So angle so, of arrival, angle of departure. Angle of arrival is like asset tracking is the, is the primary use case. Um, and angle of departure, it's really more indoor positionings like uh, systems like uh, uh, wayfinding. So with my uh, angle of departure enabled phone, that phone will uh, uh, have to support 5.1. Uh, but it won't need to have an antenna array on it. It'll be uh, still a relatively low-cost um, uh, radio uh, antenna and, uh, and, and device. But it's just going to see it's going to see a whole bunch of signals that are different phases or whatever coming from the from this uh, this fixed uh, located device. So we'll, so we'll yeah. look at uh, <laughs> there you go. yeah. So we have a uh, so we have uh, a located device here. Uh, this one happens to be made by Cooper. Um, and for those uh, are listening, it looks like a frisbee. And so this has basically one radio but eight antennae in it. And today it is. Uh, it uh, can receive a signal from a beacon that might be on a pallet or even uh, hopefully in the future with uh, Williard, it'll get a, a, t a tag from something that's in, a, in someone's uh, clothing or a, or, or, or a package. But anyway, it's receiving a beacon. The beacon's moving around. This is in a fixed point. And explain to me how the... So this has one receiver, but it's got multiple an antennae. How, is, how does this get an angle... Uh, how does this return an angle to the location engine 
uh, when it sees this beacon? Is that is there a so that way? so I think what you're referring to now is is a more of an angle of arrival situation. Angle of arrival, yes. Yeah, right. So so now I have an ass attack potentially yeah. one of your own yeah. that is transmitting yeah. in a t from a single antenna. So yeah. that signal from that antenna yeah. is coming up, and then all of a sudden it's now uh, hitting the antenna array across uh, uh, in that's within the within the the locator device. Right. And that signal is actually as it crosses the various antenna, mm -hmm. um, the all the the device is also taking a um, IQ samples mm -hmm. um, from each of the antenna at a very uh, specific time. Mm -hmm. And as that signal is crossing all of those antennas, it'll actually the antennas will actually see a phase uh, phase difference uh, from that signal as it crosses those antenna. Okay. And it can use those samples then to to put a lot of intelligence on top to then interpret. And figure out which direction the signal is coming from. So I've got a dumb tag. It's just sending out one packet, and it's the, all the smarts are, are in this locator, and then the locator engine that's looking at the difference in phase of the signal as it hits these different uh, antenna pieces. And then I I confuse things. So let's go back to the thing we started off there, which was <laughs> the, uh, the when we flip it around and. Uh, um, uh, so angle of departure. So in this case, I've got my phone, um, yep. and this guy is actually starting to transmit. Uh, mm -hmm. And so what does my phone see that allows the, the phone to figure out where the, the source of all of these signals is? That's right. So now there is a, a locator signal, a yeah. special kind of signal. It's not nothing too dramatic, but it's yeah. a special kind of signal that's being transmitted and it's being sent from all of the antenna in the array. Right. And so now the, the what the handset's going to see is multiple signals coming essentially from that device. Yes. So each of those antennas is transmitting. So all those signals from that device are all going to hit the single antenna in your phone at slightly different times. Mm -hmm. And as long as the phone also has kind of knowledge of the layout of the antenna in that device, mm -hmm. it's then able to use that information. It says, okay, here's all the signals I'm seeing coming from that device, and based on how I know the layout of the antennas in that device is, I can then determine or estimate, you know, the direction from which that those signals are coming from. Okay. That's very good. I, th I think you've done a marvelous job of explaining that. So I'm going to throw in one other variation that hopefully it's not going to completely make everyone's head spin. But is there a scenario where you could have angle of arrival on a phone? Absolutely. And I think that's, you know, I'm very excited about those use cases, right? I think that's the one where I mentioned um, uh, these personal item tracking tags, right? Yes. Yeah, so if I want to put something on my keys or my wallet or purse or whatever, right now the the phone, which has a single antenna on it, um, not using direction finding in AOA AOD, mm -hmm. it, it only can use signal strength, so mm -hmm. it can only determine where it is. It cannot understand the posi you know the direction unless you put an antenna array in this, and it's able to then you know have that signal cross those antenna and then determine the direction from which that signal is coming from. So applications like uh, adding directional finding to ad personal asset tracking can't be done until that. Or there's a lot of fun other applications like that are in beacons. So say I go into um, you know, a, a place that has a lot of point of interest information beacons, like mm -hmm. a museum. Mm -hmm. um, so say uh, there's a whole bunch of exhibits in this specific room, all of them have beacons on it. Mm -hmm. Right now, just based on proximity, my phone can wake up an app and it can say, hey, here's all the eight exhibits in this room that happen to have uh, information about them with beacons. You know, which one do you want? And that's, that's great, it's a good experience. Mm -hmm. But now, if, if this had uh, an antenna array with AOA in it, I could potentially just point my phone at a specific exhibit and all of a sudden it could immediately just give me more information about that. So many, many fun use cases um, should the handset community uh, decide to add yeah. um, AOA uh, receiver functionality, if you will, into yeah. the, the handset. So I'd, I'd certainly love to see that happen. Yeah, yeah, it'll be interesting. I mean, if I was a big company that made handsets that uh, really wanted to put some new features in that would make the new version useful, then this is something that I, I would put in there. Because, I mean, the, one of the use cases that I love is you're, um, you're in CVS or Walgreens or whatever, and you're trying to find, you've been told, I need this kind of um, uh, Advil. And there's, you know, it's not just one Advil, there's three different kinds of Advil. 
and you ask for help and they say, hey, it's on aisle three, but aisle three has got like 200 different boxes of pills. And if I could have a box of pills that had a Bluetooth tag associated with it and I could use my phone and it basically I'd punch it in and it's Advil PM or whatever and it tells me where it is. That could just save a lot of stress and uh, time and uh, it would be a wonderful thing. So here's hoping they decide to, d to, to do that. What, uh, you know, what's your uh, prognosis on the likelihood of the handset guys uh, doing that? Because you know, they, they all love new features, but uh, that's, um, you know, it's a more complex device, so presumably it adds more cost. So uh, that's, that's the downside of adding it. Well, these devices are, are, you know, every year getting more and more complex. If you think about the number of radios and uh, and, and layouts of antenna on these devices, I mean, I, I certainly think it's it's achievable, and it's and I think it's you know these guys are driven by what they they believe are the ability to deliver new compelling you know uses and use cases to to the consumer. And I think this is this is one that I would certainly argue can. Yeah. Reach you know reach that that level and and cross that uh, that cross cross that line or bar or whatever you want to say. So I I hope it gets there, uh, but I I've stopped trying to predict what uh, those kind of those companies uh, you know will do. They've got a lot of things to accomplish, uh, and a lot of things to do. But I think this is this is a good one. Very good. Well, more generally, um, how is this being uh, accepted? Because this is this is a major thing, and it's not something you click your fingers and people download the new version of the software and it's there, you've got infrastructure and infrastructure is notoriously hard. I do know from my experience, uh, well, A, I, I, I'm, I'm bullish, so I'm, gonna, I'm not being <laughs> a independent interviewer, I'm afraid, but uh, uh, because I have seen um, you know, other companies other than uh, these guys from Finland, they're, they're working on this stuff. And uh, so, so I know that there's hardware coming, but it's going to take a while, I think. Uh, what's, what's your general commentary on how 5.1 direction finding, angle of arrival, angle of departure is, uh, is being um, accepted by the developer, uh, by the device community? Yeah, a couple of ways I, I think I'd look at that. Um, one is, uh, and I'll, get, I'll, I'll cover second, which is you know, generally how uh, when Bluetooth releases a new capability, the kind of path that that needs to to go through in order to ultimately get into the to the end market which is a pretty prescribed kind of approach um, but one of the things that as you mentioned why I'm also happen to be bullish is two things one is um, the, uh, the the market proof that this, there's an appetite for this this kind of thing right in general we know location services are just growing in every forecast I see for Bluetooth based location services continuing to grow dramatically whether it's the more simple proximity systems or the more sophisticated positioning systems like asset tracking and location services. The demand from the consumers, whether it's true consumers or businesses looking to do things, seems to continue to be high. So that's that's a good indicator that this the, the pieces are in place. The other one, and, and this happens a lot with, with Bluetooth technologies, is before a new capability gets into the standard, Often, our member companies will do pre-standard versions of it or proprietary implementations of a capability. Um, that happened, uh, and you know, almost every time we release something new, that happens. And that's the case here. As you mentioned, Coupa, uh, Fathom, there's some other companies and mem member companies that have added, added the ability to do radio direction finding using Bluetooth before we actually got into the standards. What that does for me is it, it actually, I think there's a lot of learning that goes on in the process, and so they can bring that in when we standardize to make sure that it's done correctly. And it also gets a lot of the, any of the, of the technical risk um, out of it. So we're not releasing something new that we don't know whether it's really going to work in the real world. I mean, we know radio direction finding using Bluetooth based on what, what Coupa and others are seeing is, is delivering very good results. So that kind of takes that risk out of the equation. So then it really comes to, well, okay, great. So if the demand's there and, and technically we know it's going to work, um, it really gets to the, to the process, as you said, of getting, getting the technology into the infrastructure. And Bluetooth, the way it works is, you know, the 5.1 is the core radio spec. This requires radio changes. So that means the whole silicon community, they need to get their, their chips done. The stacks that go along with that need to get done. That needs to feed into the module community that then feeds into the end product development community. So there's a kind of this, this, this uh, ecosystem uh, chain that needs to get worked through before products actually get into the end market. So I think that we're working through that right now. I think you're, if you're tracking it, there's um, a lot of the silicon guys are now announcing their support if they haven't already. 
um, for uh, direction finding feature in their products. So um, some of their chips are now coming with that capability. So that's the first step and that's good. And I hope to start seeing some of the next steps over the next, uh, throughout the rest of this year really, about the you know, module suppliers and then ultimately end product developers doing this. Now on that last one, I would probably start to see, expect to see some of the more commercial use cases for the technology coming to market before the consumer ones. Like you mentioned, the consumer ones are a lot of them are driven by what the handset guys do, and, mm. and that that just takes takes longer. But these more commercial use cases, like asset tracking, tracking where the handset's not necessarily involved, it's more of a like a, a locator, like you just showed a, a few minutes ago from like Koopa, and the tags themselves, which really are, there's there there's no no big change from mm -hmm. the stand from the pre-standard to the the standard variation there, just you know, the, 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 the nature of the signal you transmit, but the underlying capability is still the same. So I think in that market, I'm, I'm hoping that we'll start to see some actual commercial deployments uh, sooner rather than, than later there. Yeah, I, I think this is going to change the way manufacturing and warehousing is done. Uh, I mean, in the past, uh, and I say that having kind of seen a, a project from kind of conception, this idea to, to implementation using using this technology. Uh, before I joined, joined Willio, I was an independent consultant and uh, I worked on a project that actually you guys featured when you launched uh, the, uh, uh, the, the standard for, uh, for NGK Ceramics, amazing Japanese car parts manufacturer. Um, and I, I remember the head of technology, a uh, really smart guy, called me in. Uh, he, saw the book, the Beacon Technologies book, called me in, and uh, um, basically we, we kind of thought about how are we going to track thousands of pallets in this massive manufacturing environment with a lot of metal and furnaces and uh, hot as Hades in the summer. It's just a very challenging environment. Um, and we did a full kind of spec of what we needed the system to do. And we hadn't made our mind up that it was going to be Bluetooth. I was kind of, we were interested in uh, um, ultra wideband. So we, we actually solicited proposals from a whole bunch of um, ultra wideband companies, some well established ones and some new ones. And we found like the ultra wideband was, um, you know, a lot of it was just incredibly expensive. And uh, the, uh, and the, you know, the battery life was not, uh, was not terribly good, um, uh, but there were some other strengths that they had. I mean, very good fidelity, uh, but 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 literally in some cases our our bids were ten times what the Bluetooth bids were, and then we got a range of Bluetooth bids, and some of them were you know the classic um, trilateration signal strength approach to assets, and the problem there was we had just a sea of locators because you. You know, it's tough when you're measuring signal strength to figure out where the thing is. Uh, it, it was still a lot cheaper, but the infrastructure was, it wasn't just the cost, it was just having so much of it there. And the thing about, um, uh, you know, Cooper won the day because we didn't need very many of these things. Uh, they could be way up in the rafters and they look kind of cool. Uh, you know, it's like, uh, I feel proud to introduce this. So. Uh, and then we brought it in, we put it through its paces, and we were able to literally draw a line on the factory floor. And, uh, you know, my job was, okay, you ran the RFP, uh, who won? Let's make sure this does it. And so I was like, kind of nervous. Uh, but I got one of the tags, and I literally stood on one side of the line, walked on the other side of the line. And, you know, part of the use case is there, the, the flow of production can't go backwards. If it does, then bad things, really bad things happen. And, and uh, we were literally able to dance one side of the line, the other side of the line, and, and the system knew where the, where the tag was. But the last thing I want to say about this, which I don't think hopefully the NGK folks won't, won't, won't object to, um, the, the, the head of technology did a really good job of uh, calculating the ROI, and it was significant uh, to justify this project. But the thing that uh, was really... Uh, uh, it was a, the, the human factor of uh, uh, because we kind of did the proof of concept and uh, we needed the, these guys, Japanese manufacturers, very kind of demanding, and they wanted to see the system operating. And so what the, uh, the team did is they put tags on the robots that moved the 
pallets around in the factory. And so showing the executive team this screen where you see all of the assets moving around in real time was like, man, this is sold. You know, it was the, that was, um, it, it became clear that this is something big and it's something new and it's going to change the way manufacturing is done because in the past it's kind of been a black box. The stuff comes in the back and it comes out the front and what happens in the middle is, you know, who knows? And things get lost or you know, it just takes a while to locate them. But if we can tag the raw materials, the, you know, the work in progress, the finished product, the tools, the people, and we can see all this stuff moving around and that's fundamentally going to change the way we we manufacture things and it'll give companies that adopt it a real edge. And uh, uh, so, uh, so I think this is very timely and I think uh, people are going to catch on. There's going to be a lot of choices and uh, Cooper have got a great lead and uh, they, they'll, they'll have other competition which will uh, drive them to uh, perform. And so I think it's going to be a really amazing thing and uh, I'm, uh, I'm excited that uh, we're part of it. Um, you did touch on one thing there, if you wouldn't mind. I yeah. mean, you, you brought up that there are, you know, there's certainly for something like asset tracking, there are alternative technologies that are, are currently, you know, available for yeah. doing that. That provide various levels of, of accuracy or, or various cost profiles and so forth. But that's one thing that, with with the addition of, of direction finding, which really I think now is may bring some significant advantages for Bluetooth versus alternative technologies that could be used for this, and that is the flexibility that comes with Bluetooth. Now, if you want to, so so the cost is always low, but now you can design a system, whether it's whether you want an accuracy that's measured in meters or you want an accuracy measured in centimeters or you want a facility where one part's measured in meters and another part's measured in centimeters. I mean, that's all now, you know, Bluetooth allows for that that flexibility uh, to allow you to, to, you know, to design the system that you want. It's not an all or nothing expensive system or, Absolutely. or something that can't get to the level of accuracy you want. It gives you that, 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 that flexibility. Absolutely. I think that's really important. Uh, at the moment, we've kind of had a limited set of tools in the toolbox. We've kind of had a hammer and we've had a saw, but we've really been missing a screwdriver. And I feel like this is like, this gives us the full set of tools and we can choose the right tool for the right job and they all work together. And uh, so I think it's gonna be very good. So, um, you know, what next? Uh, the 5.1 is out, the first uh, version of angle of arrival, angle of departure are out. Is it done or is there a, a more work to do? Uh, with specific to, to direction finding, yeah. well, I guess a couple of ways to answer that is, first of all, the Bluetooth community actually never stands still. We can't, you know, they're always trying to improve the technology to kind of meet, better meet existing use cases or, or address new use cases. Um, specific to the direction finding capability, uh, what, ad, what got added in, in 5.1 is that that's the core spec again. So that defines how the radio behaves. So that defines the, the ability for higher level applications to be able to get you know, IQ samples off of the antennas to be able to then go calculate, you know, mm -hmm. di signal direction. But for two products to actually work in using Bluetooth radios, that's where pro Bluetooth profiles come in. So that defines exactly how how people, you know, implement the product so that we know that they're going to work together. Um, so there are actually a couple of profiles under development right now for direction finding. Uh, one specific to, to the asset tracking scenario. Uh, and one that's more uh, specific to the indoor positioning kind of wayfinding scenario. So those are still in development right now, and and um, we hope to see those those completing here in the in the near future. But the 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 other thing I you know uh, was specific to to Bluetooth as a location services technology. Um, as a send ahead, there's still work going on that's going to be a little longer term, but will even you know just as exciting in my mind as the introduction of direction finding. So. Not only it, ultimately are you going to be able to understand the proximity and also direction, but what about distance? I mean, I think so. There, I think there are things in, in the works that would be nice to continue to add, as you say, tools to the tool chest mm -hmm. for developers to continue to improve the performance of of uh, their solution that uses Bluetooth technology and for location services. Um, you know, when we added direction finding, that was the first true kind of positioning capability added to, to Bluetooth explicit positioning capability. And I think there's a there's a lot of appetite and roadmap for it to continue to add more. And yeah. so I, I'm hoping that that uh, that will happen too. So so we've got distance on the horizon. Um, <laughs> but um, go back to those profiles. Can you explain a bit more about what's what what do we get? 
from the profiles that we don't have today? Well, it's re profiles really are what's going to ensure true interoperability between two devices. So you can develop, use the Bluetooth 5.1 right now to create a system to do direction finding. Mm -hmm. But profiles get down to the level of detail of exp say exact saying exactly here's how, of all the knobs we give you to twiddle, here's exactly how you should twiddle if you want to be able to have this product work with that product. Mm -hmm. So, um, um, and, and that's where, so for instance, I think before the handset guys will adopt a, an AOA radio um, uh, you know, antenna array and AOA capabilities, they need to ensure that you know, any you know, tag that is developed is going to be able to to work with what they do. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that's the profiles are really what get down to the specificity of exactly what you do to make sure that interoperability is going to be working between two products. You can do it beforehand, mm -hmm. but it ends up being part of more closed systems before they can become truly open okay. and, and enable multi-vendor interoperability. Okay, so we're likely to see a bunch of systems, new angle of arrival systems, angle of departure systems that weren't there before. It'll deliver some great functionality. But to mm -hmm. get to that, it, true interoperability, different tags working with uh, different uh, locators, then we need the profiles to, to right. make the that profiles can help ensure that. Yeah, very good. Um, okay, I think we've covered a lot. Uh, just in terms of other future stuff, uh, any uh, anything you want to say on other aspects outside of di direction finding, like uh, mesh and so forth? What's that? Yeah, what's I think there? that uh, you, you touch on a couple of things. Every now and then, Bluetooth adds a whole new function and capability. Like mesh was something that we added yeah. um, a couple of years ago, and that's to enable a whole new category of, of, of uh, control systems, automation systems uh, that really have where you have these complex device networks of tens, hundreds, or thousands of, of things that need to be able to talk to each other. So that was a whole new thing. But but again, the community doesn't sit still and, and, and rest on its laurels. It's continually looking to add uh, and up its game and make sure it's satisfying market uh, uh, demands in the markets that it's already in. So for in location services, we added direction finding, right? So that came up. In Mesh, there are some exciting new capabilities that are coming there. I think the one that is, it, we haven't talked a lot about in details, but it's not a secret, is Bluetooth audio. So Bluetooth audio has been a mainstay for, for, for Bluetooth technology. Um, and it's doing a lot of amazing things, but I think the community would, is really looking to set up uh, Bluetooth audio for the next 20 years to be a leader there. So some really, really exciting things coming uh, in Bluetooth audio here in the hopefully not too distant future um, that will really set it up really well uh, to enable a whole new round of innovation uh, in, in audio uh, using the Bluetooth radio. So. That's uh, great to get that preview, uh, some insights of what's coming. I, I, we promised to talk a bit about the marketing thing. We're probably reaching the end of most uh, people's <laughs> attention spans, but I did want to ask you about your role. I mean, you've, uh, you uh, have an incredible asset that you work with, which is the Bluetooth brand. Uh, yeah. Can you just give us a sense of how significant a brand it is? Uh, and then I want to ask you, you know, what you do with that, given that you have this brand that's so well recognized. Yeah, it's funny. I think you, you'd you sent me a, hey, there's a couple of things we may want to talk about, like what's easiest in the job and what's hardest yeah, and stuff yeah. like that. And for me, the brand is a great discussion exactly on that point because it is probably what makes life easiest as well as hardest because it is a such a well-known brand. I mean, one of our charters is to increase the awareness and understanding and, 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 and adoption. Awareness is really, really high. I think we have market studies that show that we are well into the 90s of consumer awareness of the Bluetooth brand. So awareness at that level is, is not, not a challenge. Yeah, so you're and up it, there with Coke and that. stuff like that in terms of people know what they, they, they recognize Bluetooth. It is one of the biggest global uh, brands that are out there. It's yeah. well, well uh, aware. Um, now, understanding is the difference thing, right? So I think that everyone knows Bluetooth, but has really knows it for where we started, which is as an audio technology, as an audio standard for consumer products. Now, where our growth is and where we've been spending a lot of time in the last you know, 10 years is Bluetooth has now expanded into many, many commercial and industrial use cases. And there, the brand is a, it can also present a challenge for us. So people think about Bluetooth as a consumer technology. And so we're you know, evangelizing and getting uh, a option of Bluetooth now in many, many commercial industrial environments. 
But there's a hurdle there because people think about it in their own personal way, which is, oh, that's just a consumer technology. They don't realize that Bluetooth is probably one of the most robust, reliable, low power wireless technologies. I mean, it's it's powering factories out there. There are sensors all over big robots and machines around, you know, or in factories around the world that are helping uh, with uh, predictive maintenance and so forth. It is an incredibly reliable radio. But people understanding that and getting over that hurdle in some of these new emerging markets uh, with the Bluetooth brand is is what we're where we're where we face some of our biggest challenges and helping to expand what people think about the brand and what it means. That it's not just a consumer thing. It's an incredible consumer thing, but it's also an cons- incredible technology for these more uh, industrial and commercial environments as well. And that's a lot of our energy goes to to getting people to appreciate uh, the and understand the technology in there and perceive it uh, have a, a you know really good perception of the technology in those those markets. Yeah, well, I think a lot of the things that that have been developed in the consumer space that people get and recognize intuitively that it's uh, affordable, that it's interoperable, those are valuable in the enterprise space as well. And I think uh, um, I think you've done a great job in this session in helping us to understand a bit more about what those broader applications can be. So, uh, so Ken, thanks very much for coming on the on the podcast and. Uh, uh, explaining a bit about 5.1, what we can do with it, uh, where things uh, are headed. It's, it's been great. No, oh, I've really enjoyed it. And, and again, thank you for having me on the show. So what are the three songs that you would take uh, with you on a very long trip? Well, you said, I think your question was what and why. Yeah, um, yeah. I'll actually start with the why and then I'll get to, to the what. Fantastic. So... Um, you know, my you know, deep thought here, right? Um, you know, I was thinking I'd, I'd want one song to help get me pumped, you know, energized, you know, get going in the morning kind of thing. I'd want, you know, one song that would help me mellow out, you know, what's, what do you want to do in the evening and, you know, get ready to, to wind down type of song. And then one song that's much more kind of uh, emotional and remind me of home and has other, other meaning to it potentially. So those are the three things I was going for. And so the first one, you know, lots of choices for getting pumped up. I ended up on probably a lot of people do Bohemian Rhapsody. It's a song that, you know, never ceases to entertain me. I can sit there and dance around and sing and whatever and, and yeah. get energized. Too. So, you know, for me, that's... And it's reasonably long, so you get value yeah. for your money, don't you? So That's right. And that was actually <laughs> funny on the second one. Um, so what's the Mellow Out song? And... I was thinking of some longer Floyd song or something like you know like that, but ultimately I ended up on um, Hotel California uh, from the Eagles. Love it. I'm an Eagles fan in general, that whole album and everything else, and that, that's another one. Um, and have you the, have you have you seen them? Have you had a chance? I've to? never live after all these years. I yeah. can't believe it's one that got away, but yeah. but oh well. And uh, for the last one, uh, uh, Louis Armstrong's "What a Wonderful World." Uh, uh-huh. Talk to remind me of home and has other emotional reasons for me and it never never ceases to bring a tear to the eye so yeah that's a good one for me fantastic those are great songs i'd be happy to have your songs as my songs so a uh, good choice in my opinion